everyone, my name is Shelly and I wanna welcome you on this very special weekend. If this is your first time with us, or maybe the first time in a while, we're so thankful you decided to spend your Easter weekend here with us. Here at The Grove, we wanna connect with you. That's why inside of the program you received, you'll find a connection card. We wanna encourage you to fill that out so we know how we can connect with you, be praying for you and celebrating with you. If it's your first time visiting with us, we also have a gift for you. So please, as you drop your connection card off on your way out, make sure to stop by the Welcome Center and grab that gift. Now, here's some announcements. Hey guys, Pastor Brad here in Washington, D.C. As our country gets closer and closer to November, our people will become more and more divided. The tension in the political year is a cause for high emotion, high stakes, and a high chance that relationships will be damaged. The truth is, uh, that your favorite candidate will win or lose based on how our country votes this November. But the church will win or lose based on how we treat one another between now and then. Join us on April 7th for a brand new series called Divided, a country divided, a church united. Hope to see you then. If you're just checking out The Grove, we hope that this service is a blessing to you. If you call The Grove Church your home, you know that we give because everything we have is a gift from God. And we wanna be obedient with all that he has blessed us with. We have a few safe and secure ways to give. You can give online on our website or The Grove Church app, or you can use the envelope in your program and drop it off on your way out. Now, let's continue in our service. Happy Easter. Yeah, have you ever heard this phrase that life can change in a moment? You ever heard that phrase? How, how one moment in time can change everything. W what about this? Go back to this date, January 28th, 1986. Do you guys remember where you were? January 28th, 1986? Yeah, long time. Some of you are like, I don't even know if I was there. Um, at approximately 11.40 a.m., uh, the Challenger 7 took off just to my left on the other side of the river. You guys now remember where you were? Uh, I was on, it was one of my earliest childhood memories. I actually was on the side of US-1 with my mom. I was uh, in preschool, and on that day, I guess I didn't go to school. I just stayed with mom. So probably mom's least favorite day of the week, my favorite day of the week. And um, somewhere along US-1, we pulled her car over, and we got out. And I remember, just like everyone else in Space Coast Central Florida, looking up to the skies to watch the beautiful Challenger 7 take off once again, to hear its roar, to see this, everything that would take place in the victory of that shuttle. But 73 seconds after takeoff, the Challenger 7 exploded. What about 16 years later in this same town, there'd be a moment in time that a young single, Barry Russell, would walk into the church uh, over at West Side, uh, we would walk into the church uh, single with my closest friends, with my parents and my brothers. And then yet around somewhere around 2.58 p.m., I would lean forward and steal the longest kiss her grandparents ever saw their grandkids give, right? <laughs> and I would call her mine for the rest of my life. Still to this day, that lady in that photo, my bride, right? My joy. But I became a married man August 3rd. 2002. Uh, just a few short months after that, matter of fact, my wife and I got married on a Saturday, and the following Sunday, we moved to Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, we were in Bible college, and we had our first little, like, 800-square-foot apartment. It was gorgeous. It was beautiful, right? That was back in the days when you were married where you want less square footage. Now we're in the days of marriage. We want bigger houses and more rooms. <laughs> Don't raise your hand if that's you, but nod your head, guys, if that's yes. All right, we're on the same page. But there was something that happened on October 4th, 2002, that would change my life forever. There was a moment in time, actually it was about 8.35 p.m., uh, that my parents would be in a car accident on 301 just outside of Gainesville, um, a head-on collision at that, and uh, my dad would breathe his last breath. Uh, my mom, uh, suffering in the hospital for many days, even weeks, uh, we would take weeks to celebrate uh, the man that my dad was. But that moment in time changed my family. My mom's still a widow to this day. But then our grandkids growing up without what we call Papa Doug. Maybe you had a moment in your life like that. Maybe there was a tragedy that was uh, in society around you like the Challenger 7 and it shaped who you were. Because you got to say the Challenger 7 shaped the Space Coast of Florida. 
Maybe there was a moment for you where you walked in as a single person and came out as a married person, or you walked into a significant moment of time in your life like a wedding. Or maybe some of you, you became parents. Because right after that, just a few years later, 2005, at approximately 528, 528 p.m., I had my very first son. I remember how much pain I went through to get him there. I remember the agony still to this day, the torture that was upon my body, right? Y'all are like, no way. Like, no. Actually, about 528, I remember them saying, uh, Dad, hold your boy. But about 526, they push a chair underneath my leg so I wouldn't faint into the floor as my wife was doing all of the work. And then just like the theologian um, of Simba or Mufasa, whatever his name is, the dad, I'll get that right for later. I held baby Isaac up uh, in that hospital room to offer him to the Lord. And doctors and nurses tried to tackle me because they thought I was irresponsible as a dad. But it was at that moment that I knew it was going to be okay. My kids will make it. It was in those moments of time that shape and change us, or maybe yours isn't significant as that. Maybe yours is so much more greater than having a kid. Maybe it's the time that Bobby Boucher showed up at halftime at the Bourbon Bowl when the Mud Dogs <laughs> won the Bourbon Bowl. Maybe that's the time, the moment of time. Yeah, Bobby! How are y'all supposed to celebrate Jesus and Easter if you haven't even seen Waterboy? Like, come on, man. Like, you got to get with it. But there's these moments when everything changes. Like if you've seen that movie, they were losing and losing bad, bad until Bobby Boucher comes back. When Bobby comes back, they win everything. Like there's a moment in time for humanity that changes everything that we believe in, everything that we are. If you are one in the room that calls yourself a Christian or a follower of Jesus, there's a moment in time that changes everything for you. And that's what we celebrate on Easter. That, that's really what we celebrate of the, the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And all of it has to be true. If any of it's not true, all of it's not true. But there's this moment. The Bible tells us that it was actually about noon on the hour or on the clock when the earth went dark. That Jesus breathes out his last breath. That he actually says the words, it is finished. We celebrate that yesterday, or we call that Good Friday, because that's the day Jesus would die in our place. But then in those coming days, what we lead up to is Easter, is we have to choose for ourselves: Is that moment something that changes who we are, or is it just another man 2,000 years ago who died? Now, I want to look at a story in Luke chapter 24, and if you have your Bible or your phone, turn there with me. We're going to look at Luke 24. It's the walk to Emmaus. It's these two guys that are leaving Jerusalem, and they're walking on the seven-mile journey um, towards the town of Emmaus, and it's literally the days after the crucifixion of Jesus. And they're having this conversation about, like, wasn't that crazy? Can you imagine, like, being in um, Golgotha in that weekend? Can you imagine being around the courts or the trials? Or maybe you were there when Jesus and his, and his closest friends came into town on the triumphal entry a week ago, and people laid branches and jackets. They praised his name, shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Christ the King. Like, he's the one. We're going to worship him and give him everything we have. And then just days later, they're saying, no longer Hosanna, but now they're shouting, crucify, crucify, crucify. They're ready to worship him in one moment. They're ready to kill him in the next. And these guys are walking down this road and they're saying, man, that was a crazy weekend. That was crazy. Everything that took place one weekend, they're having this conversation back and forth. And then in this conversation, it says that Jesus walks up to them. They don't recognize that it's Jesus, but Jesus walks up to them and they're going back and forth between each other. Man, what took place? He was tried. He was found guilty. Barabbas, the murderer, was set free. Like, can you believe that? And the guy's like, I can't believe that. Why would they, why would they take this guy who claims to be God and kill him, but let the guy who's killed many people go? Like, it doesn't make any sense. And then did you see how the Romans handled him? Like, they tortured him. They ripped his flesh. They stripped him of his clothes. Like, did you see the crown of thorns they put on his head? Did you see his new robe? Like, they, they nailed him to a tree. Dude, that was crazy. They're having this conversation, and Jesus says, what are you guys talking about? And the two guys in Luke 24, they're like, what? We're talking about Jesus of Nazareth, he replied. They, they, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, and before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. 
But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more is it is the third day since all this took place. They're, they're walking with Jesus, but they don't know it's Jesus. And they literally say, are you the only guy here who hasn't seen the text? Like you got no voicemails, no social media posts. You haven't seen the news in any of the coffee shops you went to. They're like, there's no way you don't know what happened. Like this guy named Jesus who we thought was the savior of the world. We thought, this is their, their declaration. We thought he was the one that would redeem God's people. We thought he was the one. He was handed over to the authorities of the law and the law killed him. They crucified him. And now it's been crazy. It's been dark. It's been hopeless. It's been desperate. But for three days, he's dead. And we're leaving Jerusalem and we're walking to Emmaus. But how do you not know about what's taking place? See, what you and I know now about that story in Luke 24, what they didn't know then was those two men were referring to the moment of purchase. See, there's a moment in time where all of our sin was purchased, all of humanity. For, for the billions that exist today and the billions that have gone between or before us, all living things. If you go back to the beginning of Genesis, it tells us in the very beginning that God created man and woman, and they said it was good. And the only thing that wasn't good was that man was alone. So God uh, put man to sleep and gave us woman. And then together, he gave them the land. In the Bible in Genesis, it's kind of a weird way to think about it. But here's the clearest way. Is it says they were naked and unashamed. What that means simply is this. They had nothing to hide from. They had a pure relationship that was right. And it was created in the eyes of God. And, and they had each other and him. And that's all they had. And that's all they desired. And then one day, sin crept in. And when sin came into the picture, and Adam and Eve fell to sin, and they sinned against God, all of a sudden their eyes were open. And they saw that there was something they needed to now hide from. And from that very moment, all of humanity has been in need of a Savior. No matter who we are, no matter where we're from or what we've done, we all are desperately in need of a Savior. From that very moment in time, at, at that specific hour, humans and God were separated for eternity. And what we know to be true is simply this, that God's plan from the beginning is that he would give his one and only son to die in my place. The Bible prophesied about that. What that literally means is it foretold. It, it told hundreds of years in advance. The prophet Isaiah told about the man named Jesus, the Messiah, who would come and be slain on our behalf. It's the moment of purchase that these two guys on the road to Emmaus, they don't understand the moment. But you and I know the story now. We know what they're referring to is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That 600 plus years before the birth of Christ, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5 said, he would be pierced for our transgressions. He would be crushed for my iniquities. You can put that word right there and say my wrongs, my shames, my deliberate choices against a good God. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. That punishment was death. And by his wounds in his death, you and I can be healed. And then I love Isaiah 53, 6. It's kind of like this little rhythm that, that just placed out here hundreds of years before Christ, kind of just in this way that just flows so beautifully. It says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on himself the iniquities of us all. It's a beautiful lyric to think about everything we've ever done was placed onto the flesh of Jesus. And it was hammered and nailed to a tree on whose behalf? Our behalf. The moment of purchase is where God would give his one and only son, John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world. He so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, the person of Jesus, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This is God's story. It's his redemption plan that, that man and woman would sin against an all-knowing, all-loving God, but God would love you enough to pay for your sin. The Bible's very clear that you and I, we've, we may have sinned in different ways, but here's the truth. Every one of us alive today has sinned against God. And the only payment for that sin is death. And that death must come from the person of Jesus. Why? He was the only one born of a virgin. 
lived a sinless life, not born into or from sin, but born from the Spirit of God into humanity, fully God, yet fully man, lived a sinless life, never once sinned against his mom and dad in disobedience, never once exaggerated one little fish story, never once told anything that wasn't true, never once had greed or selfishness of his own, never once one white lie, one small sin, or one murder, or one rape, whatever spectrum we show of our sins. Completely sinless, yet died a sinner's death. This week as I was preparing for Easter, I've been reading some scripture leading me up to the cross, and one of those stories that I read through was when Jesus went before the Father just before he was arrested. And he begged and pleaded to the Father, and he said, like, God, like, or Dad, Father, uh, if there's any other way, please may it be. You know what he's asking? He's saying, God, I know you're good. I know your plan's perfect and I'm willing to do whatever you desire of me. But God, please, if there's any other way to pay for the sin of all humanity, please may we find a way. And God and all that God is and all of his goodness and all of his grace sticks to his plan that he would give his one and only son to die to pay the entire payment and punishment of my sins and your sins and our sins for all of humanity. Jesus cries out saying, if there's another way, please, Lord, but if there's not, may I go as you go. And he takes on the sin of the world. He takes on our iniquities like hundreds of years before the prophet Isaiah told before Jesus was ever delivered onto earth. And he lives that out as what you and I now can call the moment of purchase that God loves you sin separated you, and you must choose to believe Jesus to be who he says he is. And a part in believing who Jesus says he is is you have to believe the resurrection. Because what that moment is in life is this. It's the moment of proof. See, no, no one of historian of any kind, no kind of deep intellect will ever argue the fact that a man named Jesus lived. No one's going to ever argue the fact that the man named Jesus from Nazareth was actually a really good dude. And everywhere he went, he healed a lot of crippled people. He gave sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf. He, he rescued and redeemed people from all walks of life. No one disagrees with that. The disagreement begins at the tomb. You see, even historians outside of biblical context will tell you that that man called Jesus, who claimed to be the Savior and Messiah, was crucified in the hands of Rome. Other facts will tell you that he was placed into the borrowed tomb by the rich religious leaders of that day. No one disagrees or argues the fact that Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. Where the argument begins or the, the proof lacks for them is simply this. Three days later, the tomb's empty. Three days later, they don't know what to do with the thought concept that the Bible says on noon that day, the earth goes dark. The curtain and the temple torn into two. What they're struggling with is this moment of proof. What do we do with an empty tomb? Like if it's already not bad enough, we put everything we had. It's Easter, so can I say? We put all of our eggs in that basket. And we said, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus is the Messiah. And these guys themselves said, we thought he was the one to redeem. And I took all of my eggs and all of what I have, and I placed them in the basket of Jesus. And I say, it's Jesus. Little do I know that the Roman government's stepping in, and they're crucifying my Jesus. And he's being wrapped in grave clothes and buried in a tomb. And now he's dead. And now what? It's been three days. And nothing has happened. There's no life change. There's no life period. The earth is dark and Jesus is dead. And these guys are walking on this seven-mile trek from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And Jesus is right there walking with them in close proximity, having an engaging conversation with them. It goes to say that he actually teaches them everything in the scripture about himself. Pause for a moment and think about that. The author of God's word, the creator and sustainer of life, sits or doesn't sit with you, walks with you, and tells you everything, every mystery, and every thought of the scripture concerning himself. Incredible. No degree can stand up to that. 
No theologians or no study books can stand in place of Jesus telling you everything about Jesus. And these guys are lost. They're confused. They, they don't know what next. They, they go on to say uh, in verse 22, they say, hey, and if it's not bad enough that Jesus is dead, check this out. Some of our friends, some of our women, they amaze us. For they went to the tomb early this morning and they didn't find nobody. Jesus isn't there. The body's not there. Like death is no longer there. The tomb is op open. The stone is rolled away. The dead clothes are folded nice and neat, ready to be reused on the next person. And he's like, I don't know if it wasn't crazy enough that the redeemer is now no longer redeeming, but he's dead. Now he's missing. He's missing. He's, he's gone. And, and it's not just the women that told us that, but our friends our companions, our dudes, they went too. And they've also came and said, exactly like the women said, they saw no Jesus. They're looking for proof. Look, some of us tonight, we came to church because this is what we do on Easter. You're thinking Saturday night, perfect. Now I can do my normal Easter morning stuff with my family and I still get to come to church. But if truth be told, you have doubts and questions inside about this dead Jesus. You've heard the story before. Maybe you've even read the text. Maybe, just maybe, you've even done some deep study about the person of Jesus with Jesus. But you still just say, hey, I don't know, man. Where's the proof? The proof is simply this. He's the only person in all of humanity that's ever foretold his death, burial, and resurrection, and it actually happens. Plenty of people call themselves God or say they're Jesus. I met one at Dunkin' Donuts on US 1 last week, right here in Titusville, Florida. He said he's the Messiah, and he's came for iced coffee and salvation for all. Plenty of people in humanity and religion all around the sphere of the earth have made claims that they were God or they were Messiah and they were going to save and redeem their people. But all of them have died and not returned. But one. But one, no one disagrees that Jesus of Nazareth died. No one disagrees he was a good guy. Many religions even would say he's a prophet and that he was a really good person and did a lot of really good things. But what they come to the, uh, the decision on is simply on the resurrection. Do they believe it or do they not? Many people are stuck saying, but man, there's just an empty tomb. There's an empty tomb, but where's Jesus? These guys walking on the road to Emmaus, they were there. They were there. They, they might not have been at the crucifixion, but they were in town. And they heard the trial, and they saw Barabbas running free, and they saw Jesus going to the tree, and they saw everything that took place in between. They were there. But you know what? They weren't the only ones there. Matter of fact, years later, maybe 30 or 40 years later, Paul writes a letter to the church of Corinth. It's titled 1 Corinthians, and it's in chapter 15. He writes us this letter to say that there was over 500 witnesses that saw Jesus fully alive after the resurrection, after the empty tomb. Think about this. The men guarding the tomb would have had to give their life if Jesus went missing. The men in the armies of Rome around that area, all of them will die if Jesus is lost. They all, life's on the line. They were protected and guarded better than anything ever in history. And yet Jesus is no longer there, but now he comes to over 500 people in the coming days and reveals himself to them. You've read the story with me before. Actually, last Sunday, we talked about Thomas. And how Jesus appeared to the 12 and he said, Thomas, touch my hand, put your hand on my side, see where I was pierced for your transgression, see where I was beaten for your iniquities. Like, Thomas, I'm alive and I'm alive for you. And in, in me, you too can be alive. The proof's not just in the 500 witnesses or the 500 men that saw it, but I would say the greater proof for me is in the men close to Jesus be willing to give their life to brutal forms of death because they saw Jesus alive and therefore lived their life in belief that the proof was real. Take Peter, for example. You know, Peter got a bad rap because he denied Jesus. Peter, Peter was the guy that at the table told Jesus, hey, wherever you go, I go. Really, the, the biblical term for this that we would all say is Peter was Jesus' ride or die. 
And he said, you die, I die. Wherever you ride, I ride. Like, I'm with you, Jesus. And Jesus tells him, Peter, man, I love you, dude. You're, you're, you're my guy. But I'll, I'll be honest with you, Peter. You're not my ride or die because before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, before that moment in time, see, back then the clock didn't exist, but the rooster did. And when the rooster crowed in the morning, you know it's morning. You know the sun's up. You know the day's there. Why? Because the rooster crowed. God made it that way. And what Jesus is telling Peter, Peter, before tomorrow morning, and before the clock goes off, before the rooster crows, listen, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter's like, never will I ever. And then Jesus gets arrested. He starts to get beaten, starts to get made fun of and mocked and like paraded through town. And it's in that moment that Peter starts to back up and say, whoa, whoa, maybe I don't want that. You see that spear? You see those hammers and nails? Woo, Jesus, you got this, bud. I'm going to hang out over here. And it's in that moment that we, we see like this 11-year-old little girl punk Peter out. Like, who's afraid of an 11-year-old girl? Not me, right? Not me. Jesus, sitting at a fire, and this little girl says, hey, aren't you, aren't you with Jesus of Nazareth? Aren't you with the guy that's being arrested right now? And he's like, nah, never heard of him. Not me. Denial number one. And over the next coming hours, Peter denies him two times, and it's in that time that the rooster crows, and I believe that Jesus looks at Peter and says, I know you and I still love you. And Peter looks at Jesus and says, how did you know that about me? And then Jesus goes on to die. And Peter's lost and he's confused. And he's like, man, in his last hours, in his last day, I betrayed the one I said I loved. How did he know I would betray him? And Peter's hope was lost when the earth went dark at noon. And the moment of time when the curtain tore and all hope was gone, like it fled into depression. Peter's stuck for days wondering, how did he know? And then Jesus comes back from the tomb and the Spirit of God tell the women, hey, go tell the guys. And I love these three words in the story of the gospel being shared to the disciples. And they say, and tell Peter. Because see, when Peter denied Jesus, it's like all of, all of earth saw and heard Peter denied the one he said he loved. But when the Spirit of God spoke, it was as if all of heaven told Peter, hey, God knows you and he still loves you. They said, go tell Peter. Peter gets up from the room and he runs to the empty tomb. Why? Because he wanted to see it for himself. That same Peter goes on to be crucified upside down for the sake of the gospel. Who would die a terrible death for a lie? But Peter believed it to be true. He understood for himself the moment of purchase that Jesus' death on Golgotha, on the hill of the skull, was for his sins and his denials. But he also knew that his resurrection was the life that Jesus promised him anew. And he was going to live that life to the very last breath. What about you? What about you? Is the moment of purchase enough for you? Have you came to the realization that the moment of, moment of purchase was on behalf of you and your sins? That Jesus willingly and joyfully died in your place. What about the moment of proof? Like, do you believe the empty tomb was enough? If you don't believe the empty tomb was enough, do you believe the 500? That they were alive and well? Like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, that, hey, these guys are still alive. Many of them are still alive. If you don't believe it to be true, go sit with them and hear for yourself. You guys know in court today that like one broken ring camera is enough. Like, think about the ring cameras we pay for. They never record everything on time. But one camera that proves you were there or you were not there is enough for you to be acquitted. Can you imagine if you went to court and tried on your behalf and you said, hey, wait a second, Your Honor, I have 500 witnesses that say I was here, not there. And the, the judge says, oh, bring them forward. You're going to be set free if you have one. If you have two or three, like, that's an anomaly. If you have 500 500 people saw and experienced the risen Jesus, and it was written about 30 or 40 years later, and now thousands of years later, the testimony is still to be true. Why? Because everything in God's word, everything he says, everything that was said about him all hinges on this one point, this one moment. I'm going to die, I'm going to be buried, and I'm going to raise again. And as soon as that tomb's empty, everything he says, like, I love you, like, I know you, and I still love you, 
must be true. Why? Because the proof is there. The moment of proof is real, that Jesus rose from the grave. But what about you? When you hear the story of Jesus, when you, when you hear this story of his brutal murder, the senseless act of a sinless man dying a sinner's death, what does it do to you? What does it do in your heart and your head or your emotion? I heard a story this week about Grove students. Probably the best thing that happens in this building all week, every week is Wednesday nights. 200 students gather in this room right here, and they hear about Jesus on a level for them, middle school and high school. We split middle school and high school. Then we also split male and female. Uh, throughout the night, we do, these, uh, we do a message from stage, and we do these breakouts where they take Jesus and hear it on a level that they can understand. Best thing that happens in the Grove building Wednesday nights, right? But I heard a story of a week or so ago as they were reading through this story of the death of Jesus in the crucifixion, one of our female leaders, high school leaders, um, she paused as they were reading and she asked the group of high school girls that she had uh, there uh, in this group. And she said, hey, um, she was trying to hold back her emotion, right? Kind of fighting back what that story does to her. And she says, hey, uh, what, is this, what does this do to you when you hear this story? When you hear that a man was brutally murdered on your behalf because of your sins, because of your wrongs, like it led this guy to endure the cross in the hands of the Romans. What does it do to you? And one girl spoke up full, uh, 100% vulnerability. She said, I've read this story so many times, I just don't care anymore. Here's the truth for some of us tonight. I think there's some of us in this room that we've heard this story so many times, that we've celebrated this holiday so many times, that we've, we've heard the ending so many times, that we just now don't care anymore. A guy died 2,000 years ago in a faraway land, and they called him Jesus, and three days later, he rose again. Who cares? Matter of fact, these two guys walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus on a seven-mile trek, walking with Jesus himself, but they don't know that yet, they're thinking the same thing. We thought he was coming to redeem his people, but now he's dead. And what's crazy, it's been three days, and no one's heard from him. They just didn't care. And it says in that moment that they went to the house and they broke bread. And it wasn't until they were at the table that the moment becomes personal. I think for you and I tonight, we have to come to this realization that the moment of proof and the moment of purchase, they've already taken place. They've already happened for all of humanity worldwide. It's happened. But the moment it's personal, you have to decide when you believe it to be true. And for these men, it was when they broke bread. Luke 24, 30 and 32 says this, that when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Their eyes were opened. It became personal for them. And they said to themselves, man, like when we were walking with him, were not our hearts burning with passion? Like were they not burning within us? Maybe that's where you are right now. Maybe you came in tonight with doubts and disbelief. Maybe you came in tonight just to celebrate a holiday that you celebrate because your mom and dad invited you or your spouse or your family or your friends. They say, hey, come celebrate Easter with me. So you just came. But maybe there's something about this story that's starting to burn within you for the very first time. Maybe now your eyes are open that the death of Jesus has everything to do about your sin and you as a person. What we bring to the table is the only thing that makes us in need of a Savior. The only thing we have to offer is the sin that is so easily entangled us. You know, often we, we hear stories about how good God is or stories about uh, how God wants to rescue and redeem his people, but we often will think to ourselves, well, that can't happen to me. I'm just an everyday person. I'm just a normal person who happened to attend church. But let me tell you about a friend of mine here at church who's an everyday person who happens to attend church. His name's Nick. Uh, Nick, God has brought Nick through like this little season of life, a lot like many of us have experienced, right? Some highs and lows, some hardships and some loss. And uh, there comes a time in Nick's life where he's a, a young father and he's now engaged to a young lady who's also a young mom. And God's going to bring together these two halves and, and make them whole. And they're actually um, in a pre-marriage class right here at the Grove Church. Uh, his fiance's name's Kara, and, and Nick and Kara are in this class, and they're hearing about what marriage looks like and what God's promise is and what they must do to be able to have a, a marriage or a relationship that honors God and, and brings glory to his name. And Nick decides that in that time, if he's going to have a successful marriage, he must have a relationship with Jesus. 
and he surrenders his life personally to Jesus, there was a moment in time where everything shifted for Nick. In that same time, Nick's praying for Kara, and, and Kara's praying for her dad, Greg. In, in the time that they're in this class and they're about to get married, Greg's going through some health issues. And matter of fact, his health is, issues get so real that he finds himself in a hospital, on a hospital bed, not sure if he'll make it through the day. I remember the text came out to Pastor Brad and I. And the text read something from their family. It said something like this. Hey, Brad and Barry, if you want to see Greg or you want to come pray with Greg, you better come today. Because they weren't sure if Greg was going to make it. They were crying out and pleading on behalf of Greg that God would step in and do something. And it was in this time where Nick's now a new believer, trying to love on his new young wife and their kids. Carrick falls on her face before the Lord. And she begs and pleads with God, God, intercede on my dad's behalf. And while she's praying all this prayer, Greg has an encounter with Jesus. He has a, a physical encounter with Jesus. And from his hospital bed, he proclaims with his own mouth that Jesus is who he says he is. And he believes and he's forever changed. And to this day, Greg's healthy. Back with his family, back walking around church, will be in service most likely tomorrow to hear this story. But Greg has this moment of time where he decides that it's personal that he wasn't just in close proximity. It's not about growing up close to Jesus or walking down the road with Jesus. That's not enough. But the purchase was real, and it was for him. And the proof for Greg was there that God knows him and yet still loves him. And Nick and Karen Greg have this beautiful encounter personally with Jesus, but it doesn't end there. Kara's son, Connor, uh, went to break at the lake for the first time last summer, this past summer. And, and at Break at the Lake, Connor had an experience with Jesus. Not an experience like his grandpa had, not an experience that his mom or stepdad has. No, Connor had an experience with Jesus that was personal to him. And he came home and he told his parents, I want to get baptized. And three of those four got baptized together. Right over here to my right, to your left, in a service just like this. Why? Because Connor made it personal that he knew Jesus for who Jesus was. But it doesn't stop there. This is, this is what happens when, when you go to break at the lake, you bring home what God does uh, in Keystone, Florida. You bring home what God does in your heart. If you're a parent in the room and you have a middle schooler or a high schooler, do whatever it takes to get your child to camp this summer. We're going to bring over 200 students this year to experience Jesus personally for themselves. If that's not enough, it's one whole week of no cell phone and no video games. God's going to meet them right where they are. Do whatever you can to get your kid there. Maybe you're sitting here right now and you're saying, Barry, I don't have a kid that age. My kid's out of the house or my kid's too young or my kids are grown and like they're not around. Do whatever it takes to help us get teenagers there. Camp's expensive. I'll say it like that. Help a teenager have a personal encounter with the risen Jesus. They're worth it. Connor comes home and tells his little brother Isaac, he tells Isaac, Isaac, I'm getting baptized. And Isaac said, I've been hearing a lot about that in the rise, which is our ministry for fourth, fifth, sixth graders. Josh Gerard leads that ministry. And I got to say, he's incredible. He is incredible. He's just the perfect weirdness to serve that age. God, when God crafted Josh, he knew he crafted him for a reason. And I see that reason as him teaching fourth, fifth, and sixth graders about the great love of Jesus in a level that they understand, not in a watered down level. In a level simply like this, that their sin has separated them eternally from an all-knowing, all-loving God, and they must choose to believe for themselves. Is Jesus' resurrection real? And if it's real, when is that moment of time that you're going to make it personal? But you know, that story didn't end with Isaac either. It actually started over a decade ago. 13, 14 years ago, Mark and Diane Johns get married. They both came out of other marriages, and uh, they get married. God brings them together. And one of the things in this new adventure of this marriage for them was this idea of grace, that they were going to do something different than they did before in their past marriages. And one of those differences was they were going to do church together for the first time as a married couple, together. Not separate beliefs or separate, separate services, but together they're going to do church. And at this time, they were living on the west coast of Florida, and this church was building a new auditorium. And, and as they were building this new auditorium, they invited families to come to church and write names on the studs of the wall. 
asking God to do something in those, in those lives as they write them out. In Mark and Diane Johns, they wrote their children's name out, one daughter and two sons. One son, Nick. One son, Jason Johns. And they wrote these names on the board years, years ago before Nick or Jason ever stepped foot into this building or into this church. But just a little over a year ago, my brother Brad was wrapping up a service just like this, like in his final moment or two of the message, right where we are right now. And he asked in the room, he says, hey, if you've heard this message for the first time and you believe it to be true, that Jesus died for you, that his death paid for your sins and you want to receive that gift. It's a free gift. Cost him everything. Cost you nothing to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. If you want to believe that, stand up right where you are right now and just say, I believe. And right here in the room in a service just like this, Jason Johns got the boldness to stand up in front of his seat and he was the first person out loud to say, I believe. I believe. That story started a decade ago with his mom and dad praying that Jason and Nick and their sister would have a living, breathing encounter with the one we call Jesus. And it was in this room that Jason made it real. What I love about Jason Johns today, he's one of the most faithful servant volunteers we have in this church. Serves seven days a week in recovery ministry for the men at Walkabout. Faithful guy who just over a year ago had no relationship with Jesus, walked the road close proximity, had godly parents or godly grandparents, but had nothing personal for himself until that day in that service where he says, I choose to believe. But that story doesn't end with Jason. Church, I believe that story ends with you. What about you? When was your moment? When, when was your moment that you decided that Jesus would be the Lord of your life, that it must be true. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It must be true. Why? Because he said so. And if he said so, it's going to be real. Just like he said he would die and be buried and raised again to new life. And he died and he was buried. And three days later, he rose again. What about you? March 30th, Saturday night, Second Grove service. This could be your moment. Remember I started off by saying there's some moments in our life that shape us. There's moments in time that like literally change the trajectory of our life. I believe in first service, I saw it to be true. Second service, I believe it's gonna be true in just a second. Right now, 7.29 p.m. March 30th. This can be your moment. Are you ready? If you believe Jesus to be the Lord of your life and you want to confess that he's, he's alive and well, stand up right now and tell me your name. Say it one more time. Kimberly. Nathan. Michaela. Love you, bro. Amen. All of heaven rejoices. It says that the angels rejoice when one person comes to know Jesus. And I believe what happens tonight here at the Grove is many people will stand. Anybody else? State their name. They believe. What's your name? Yell it. Aiden or Hayden? I'm going with. I get it? So close. <laughs> Got. Hayden, that's what I tried to spell the first time. David? <laughs> hey, God knows you. Listen, God knows you and God loves you. My analogy is not a reflection of how good God is. What about you? Trayvon or Trivon?
What about you? See, that one was easy. <laughs> this is going to be your moment. March 30th, 7.32 p.m. You can write that down on a clock. Tell your family that one day God stepped into your life, that you were dead and now you're alive. Don't let this moment pass. If you said your name, if you said your name out loud, God heard you. Heaven rejoices for you. But we have one more step for you. We want to give you a little invitation card. Tell you what your next step is. So in a moment when I pray, we're going to all stand to our feet. That's the hardest step. So I always ask you to do it with me. Just stand up where you are. Stand up. We're going to pray. We're going to close. We're going to celebrate because all of heaven is celebrating right now for these lives, especially that one who's known by God, loved by God. Despite who you are, what you've brought with you, where you've come from, what you've done, God knows you and God loves you. And this Easter, the trajectory of your life forever changed because you believed and you made it personal. So if you prayed that prayer, if you want to pray that prayer, come to the front. We have some pastors and some team members right up front that would love to pray with you, love to pray over you. Uh, I'm Portuguese and Spanish. If that's you in the room right now, I got a guy so bad that wants to pray over you in your heart language. Come to the front. Come to the front. He wants to pray with you, right? He wants to pray. And the rest of us, come get this card. Come get this invitation because your next step's coming next Sunday. Jesus, thank you for who you are. Thank you for your death. Thank you for the burial. Thank you for the resurrection. And in your life, we have new life. In your way, we have a new way, new creation. The old is gone, the new has come, that, that no longer are we dead in our, trans, our, our trespasses. No longer are we dead in our transgressions, but we're alive in Christ. Not by anything we've done or anything we can do, but by everything in the blood of Jesus and the cross of Christ, crucified. Be set free and live anew. Jesus, meet us where we are right now. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today at the Grove Church Online. We hope that service and that message was incredibly encouraging to you. Hey, I don't know where you are spiritually, but let me tell you what we believe. That God loves you and has a plan for your life. But because we've gone our own way, we live in brokenness. But the good news is, is that Jesus came and lived the life we couldn't and died the death we should have and rose from the dead, proving there's a way out of brokenness and towards God's plan for our life. If you're interested in learning more about how to have a relationship with Jesus, I'd encourage you to visit the link below. We'd love to connect with you and would love to help you take your next step in your relationship with God.